Welcome to the Travel Leader Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Vandenberg. On our show, I interview and connect with leaders across travel, hospitality, and tourism. We talk leadership in our industry, what has shaped them, the successes, failures, and everything in between. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Jeff David from Method Co. Before we start, I want to let you know about the Travel Leader community. Every month, I'll be gathering a group of travel leaders travel leaders looking to share, reflect, and grow their leadership competencies with the support of myself as a trained coach. Learn more at www.thetravelleadercoach.com. And I would now like to welcome Jeff David. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Great. Great. Is the sun shining where you are? Yeah. Currently, I'm in our new hotel in Wilmington, Delaware. So yeah, oh, it's okay. uh, uh, nice and sunny today. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, good good way to start the holiday weekend, right? I think we've got some good weather coming up this weekend. I think we do, yeah. Well, welcome. Uh, we met last month at a conference, and uh, we almost didn't have a conversation about leadership. And it happened on a, a little field trip after uh, we went to a dinner and brewery that we started chatting about a shared passion, which is leadership. And I thought, I've got to have Jeff on my show. <laughs> um, so, so glad to have you here. It's great to be here. So the way I like to start just to get our, uh, our listeners introduced to you um, is, could you kind of name for yourself the red thread that has existed throughout your career? Um, if we define red thread as the common denominator that just kind of keeps me going with hospitality, uh, I think it's two things. Uh, the cliche thing is the, you know, the meeting new people and different cultures and, and cities and countries uh, where I operated. But um, most recently, I think I'm paid to be a student, I think, because as you get on new projects and if you're motivated by intellectual curiosity, you're always just taking a step back and learning and assessing and discovering a lot more than implementing your subject matter expertise. So I guess I'm paid to learn is probably my, my red thread. That's great. What do you think having that curiosity mindset contributes to your leadership? Uh, there's definitely a common denominator in, in, in human beings. I think, I think, uh, I think that there's, uh, different customs, legal, legal, financial ways of doing things in cities and countries. But I think the human spirit and uh, kindness and altruism just runs through, you know, um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I left a 12,000 populate uh, person populated island of Anguilla to join a 60 million uh, person uh, Times Square. And I didn't change my leadership style. Uh, because, uh, you know, human beings ring through of respect, courtesy, transparency, uh, kindness, and even just as simple as re name recognition. So I, I think I discovered that very early in my career. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So what is the impact that you wanna have in the travel and hospitality industry? I never really had aspirations to be the the next uh, Barry Sternlich or Ian Schrager or anything like that. I think I have more of a modest, quiet legacy. I think I'm very proud of any, most of my number twos or threes I work with are successful GMs at notable hotels and resorts. I think uh, almost like a parent, I think the legacy you leave behind is successful hoteliers that were inspired and mentored um, by yourself. So I think that's sort of my legacy is, you know, there's successful operations and hopefully they emulate some of the styles of leadership that I did. And uh, hopefully um, 
you know, they take some of the advice uh, that I took and I also passed on from my mentors. So I think that's the legacy I'd like to like live with. Yeah. I hear, I hear a little bit of uh, humility in there and it reminds me of, I'm reading, I haven't quite finished it yet, but I'm reading Jim Collins book, uh, Good to Great. Oh, sure. And, yeah. And it reminds me a lot of, of level five leadership and that some of the greatest companies in our history have had leaders that are actually quite modest and you know, they're not, um, they're not like these very outward, like gregarious, you know, kind of charming people, although you're very charming, but no, I, you know. I actually, that's the curtain rising. I'm actually an introvert in extroverted position. So I know how to like yeah. turn it on, whether it's a yeah. staff meeting or town hall or just a room full of uh, guests, but yeah, I'm actually, uh, introspective and introverted but uh i just it's it's almost like uh i i know when the curtain rises and i have to go to the, do the charm school thing <laughs> yeah yeah well and and jim collins also talks about how le level five leaderships just what you were talking about is that um you know other other leaders who were not level five leaders they would leave an organization and everything would fall apart after they left and let you know one of the characteristics defined of level five leaders is that when they leave things are in a good position because the leader who's left has nurtured the next generation yeah um so there's a, a lot of great you're a great uh a great example i think yeah yeah i I, I do that was my tagline is i kind of work myself out of a job you know and i think it's a good way to like approach a project is I got to work myself out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's great. So how would someone who works closely with you describe you as a leader? <laughs> well, this is like, it's kind of a, a paradox because like you're, if you're humble, you don't want to talk about yourself. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think a servant leader, uh, uh, honestly, uh, I wouldn't do anything they wouldn't do. Uh, wash dishes or park cars. Um, I think um, motivational. I, I think that that's a lost art. I think that a lot of leaders are really managers that sequester them to a desk and focus on bottom line or too much strategy, not enough effort. Um, so yeah, I think I think that I think I'm 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 fueled with empathy and uh, and uh, logic. Logic and empathy, I think, is a good one. Uh, not enough logic out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's um, you know just kind of going back to that first qual quality of of kind of being hands on and willing to do what you know any job that that your staff might have to do. Why is it important for you to model that kind of behavior as a leader? Um, I think as a leader, uh, and you st I started as a dishwasher, so I started humble beginnings. But the answer is on the street. The answer isn't in a boardroom. So until you could uh, walk the shoes and understand the lens of the employee, the lens of the guest, the lens of the investor... Um, it all like connects the dots. So, you know, um, mm. uh, it's not a pure middle thing where I'm the boss and there's this, there, there's this faction of departments under me. It's basically circular where we all try to figure it out. So, um, you, you just don't know the answer if you've never been in the space or lived the space and, you know, so I think, I think that's where the empathy is, but also from intellectual side, that's where the intellectual curiosity is, is you got to be driven on why and how it works, but then you have to have that empathy of um, why they feel that way uh, uh, with the yeah. processes. So, yeah, I can also imagine, I know you're, you're the, the field you're working in now and the, and the development projects that you're doing now um, are kind of cutting edge hospitality slash residential multi-use facilities. 
I can imagine having working in many different functions um, on the ground also really helps inform that. That's right. Yeah. Process. I guess the saying goes, don't expect what you don't inspect. So yeah. there is a when you when you develop a property and I think this is where I cut my teeth in life is it's all theory. A perform is all theory. A brand is all theory. Uh, an SOP is all theory. And in an opening, it's all reality. So, you know, they say new yeah. shoes always hurt and all that, all that, all that reality just outweighs the theory and they collide when you open a property and it's how well you could stick with the program or adjust your sales as necessary to get it right. So I, I think that's really missing when, when you have a vision you kind of just have to be very blue collar and you just got to bootstrap it and uh, figure it out um, uh, until it's stable and prosperous. So, yeah. Yeah. You certainly can't just sit in an office and watch other people do it. No, <laughs> no, sure. you, you have to even just pricing, right. Just, uh, just listen. And it's not just reviewing the, the dashboard of guest satisfaction. This is really just, understanding like you know being in a lineup at a restaurant saying hey what's the best sellers what's the pushback what are people thinking and i i learn a lot more from being in a lineup sometimes than reading a dashboard sure yeah absolutely so we're going to change gears a little bit um so what makes life and work meaningful for you <laughs> yeah. you know that's a very philosophical question uh, and I could answer very cliche, uh, you know, like you love what you do. You'll never work a day in your life or whatever, but it, I think it, it does ring true. I think the meaning is that, uh, you, you're as a leader, you're an influencer. And if you have the power of influence, I think that's, that's where I could, uh, go to sleep at night feeling is that uh, your staff and the guests are just a better person because of the experiences you create or curate. Um, and that sounds very esoteric, but it's true. You know, um, last night uh, in this little boutique hotel, I was just coaching uh, some staff um, just how to address people and escort them up the elevator and walk them to the restrooms. And that just felt really good to me. Um, as my days cluttered with um, spreadsheets and Zoom calls, uh, what's meaningful is just, you know, taking the time and just one staff member at a time and just coach them, uh, give them your cell phone and, you know, check up on them. So I think that's what makes it meaningful is all those little experiences. Yeah. So I hear, you know, just connecting with people at a human level and, you know, passing something useful to them that might, might make their job better. Oh yeah. It's definitely, we're all, we're in high, uh, accountable positions and sometimes when things aren't working well or we're missing forecasts and stuff, sometimes my happy place is just being on the floor. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that kind of takes me back on uh, why I chose this occupation. Yeah, absolutely. When have you underestimated yourself? Uh, all the time. I, I, I think, I think uh, I have a confidence like all leaders do, but then I, I think every good leader, at least servant leaders, go through some sort of imposter syndrome yeah. that, um, you know, you could look back and say you are confident, but I underestimate myself uh, all the time. I think that's what drives me is... Uh, if you don't have the humility that I've never run a private club before, I've never set up a, a co-working business model before, you know, I've never done residential, I've never done short-term rentals. Um, I think the egotistical person would say, I could do it. And, and I think the humble person's like, um, I got to really work hard and figure this out and understand this space. Um, so, uh, it's um, it's definitely uh, you do get an imposter syndrome to in a good way, where um, yeah. it just forces you to like not fake it to make it, but like get deep and get into the and figure out. 
um, the inner workings of these different business models. Yeah. Adam Grant actually talks about that in his book, Think Again. You know, uh, society often talks about imposter syndrome as something that you, that's bad and you need to overcome it. But what you're talking about and what, what he refers to is it actually can be a, a driver for great performance and it can be a tool to kind of check yourself um, yeah. to, to work harder and go to the next, you know, to, to really um, uh, make something better mm -hmm. um, and, and, and build that confidence for yourself in the process. Yeah, I didn't read the book, but I guess, I guess uh, I believe in that too, yeah. Yeah, it's a fabulous book. I highly recommend it. Um, it's it, it's the main premise of the book is a lot about actually influence and how how you can influence people and your own thinking through a lot of curiosity. Um, that's one of the the things he talks about is uh, you know it, it and also in this world of polarization and and debate, you know, public debate and things like that, that, um, actually asking questions and, um, the different kinds of mindsets, uh, that are important, um, to make breakthrough breakthroughs and in, in your self-knowledge and things like that. It's, it's, I highly recommend it. So what event has shaped you as a leader? There's a series of events, but probably, what defined me in my career, uh, I think was around 2009. Uh, I was opening two high profile assets for a company called Viceroy. And uh, they were an urban um, hotel company based in Los Angeles. And I was opening up their first ski resort in Aspen Snowmass and their first beach resort in the Caribbean uh, island of Anguilla. So can you imagine living in Cape Cod, Caribbean and Colorado? I know they all start with C, but I was uh, doing that. But during the recession, um, uh, the bank was taking it over um, due to foreclosure in Snowmass. And then uh, the island of Anguilla was a British island, so they didn't have um, Chapter 7 or Chapter 11. So there was no foreclosure. We had to go to Privy Council in England, but they were basically also losing their asset because it was the recession. So I was reporting to two owners, the one that was losing it and the one that was taking it over. And I had to be Switzerland and uh, work my tail off. I think packing was the hardest part because it was like jackets and shorts in the same suitcase. And uh, I think what defined me is I wasn't home for like six months. I, uh, my wife and son are angels going through this, but we knew that the recession impacted everything. It actually made me work harder because so it defined me as a family man, a husband, a father, as well as a, a hospitality professional that I could work with um, incoming outgoing ownership times two in different um, areas. And we survived both. So it was probably the toughest half year to nine months of my life, not seeing my family, like I said, packing jackets and shorts and uh, you know, uh, meeting with the German bank, uh, I think it was Bank Hypo, and a New York company, which was related, and then working with you know, uh, Citibank uh, and uh, Starwood Capital. And it was very adversarial, right? The takeover is like, what did he say? What did he say? And everything. And it was very that. So um, my admin was heavy. Uh, my travel was heavy. My, my family life was not existing in a bunch of... Uh, texts and calls, but we got through it. And, uh, that was my probably recession moment. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you had to really build a lot of resilience and adaptability through that phase. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a marathon runner. I hate cardio, but I think I just got in a zone where, uh, I didn't really see any end other than just keep going at it, you know, and just say, okay, just book this flight, book this flight, book this flight and apologize for not being home, apologize, apologize. And then, uh, we got through it and, um, took a little break after that, just a week or two to, you know, um, make up for it. And then I just went back to the grind. Yeah. How, how do you think that's helping you now? Stamina for, for sure. Uh, you, you just increase your bandwidth 
going back to the imposter syndrome, it's like, how do I manage two resorts rather than one? And then now, how do I manage four instead of two? How do I manage eight instead of four? And so it, it does build your stamina. And I think the more experiences you have and your ability to connect the dots, um, things get easier and you take on more. Yeah, for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it really is like expanding your capacity. Yeah. Capacity is a, is a good word for it. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds that it sounds pretty hard. How are you taking care of yourself during? all? Oh, that? <laughs> uh, definitely. I'm a regimented person and travel doesn't make it regimented. So I was a religious gym goer and I'm slipping a bit. Um, keto diet. I think my biggest, I do that once in a while to cleanse. So airport food could really just, you know, pack it on oh, yeah. a lot, but, um, keto There's way too many tempt temptations yeah. in the airport. <laughs> keto helps me focus and I only cycle on and off of it because it's not really sustainable year round for me. But, um, uh, I would love to say I meditate or I would love to say, you know, I sleep well. And to be honest, I sleeping is probably my worst vice. Um, uh, but yeah, I just adapt. So I think that also, uh, that guilt of not working out, I think also drives me. So, um, but that, that's sort of my happy place. And I go home on Cape Cod and this weekend I'm fishing, you know, and, uh, last week, you know, uh, like just putting the deck furniture out and everything like that. I think having two days a week is my happy place and really resetting is probably the only standardized way. Um, I, I take care of myself at this point because yeah. <laughs> diet exercise and sleep like so fluctuates, but being home every weekend and doing yard work or errands or fishing or golf is a, probably the best way I could find balance. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think everybody needs to find some kind of anchor, you know, like that, where you, even when the rest of your life is chaotic and up and down and no routine there, there's something that has to kind of stabilize you yeah. uh, in your, in your week. And that's um, probably my weekends home. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. I think being away from home, I'm, incredibly productive and incredibly imbalanced <laughs> yeah. and my wife will say i'm incredibly unproductive when i'm home but very balanced so you know yeah a lot of naps <laughs> on the sofa yeah for sure yeah yeah so what do you think are the leadership competencies that are most important for this next era of change next era of change which is I, I don't think we call them millennials anymore because I think they're like two thirds of the population. I think <laughs> uh, we just call it today's society now. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, which is weird as we talk highly philosophical, we're in an era like you could attribute that Obama got elected through Facebook and Trump got elected through Twitter. So I think you need to speak um, with technology a little bit, you know, um, employee engagement um, far beyond emails. I use a platform called Beekeeper. I love it. It, it kind of mimics LinkedIn and, and Facebook and WhatsApp all in one. So I, I think, um, you know, how to speak through social media and appeal to people through that language is unavoidable. Um, I think that's definitely not, not a philosophical statement. I think that's a trend statement that could scale and resonate. Um, text message, how many text chains have you been through with leadership that didn't exist 10 years ago, you know? So you got to adapt that way. If you just say, hey, let's set up a call like all the time. I, I don't think that works all the time, but um, you really got to balance that uh, the tech recent platforms with human interaction. So you can't, things you can't do with tech is water cooler talk, mentorship, role playing, FaceTime, uh, empathy. Um, none of that tech could replace, although there's probably an argument AI right. and stuff will start to read that and be smarter than us on that. But uh, that's another conversation. But 
I, I do think that you have to speak multiple languages. You got to be bilingual to be a humanistic leader, as well as someone who could leverage the way um, we communicate nowadays. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I'm hearing that theme of adaptability coming back again and, you know, being able to hone your message it, to different technology platforms and, and um, really being also agile, uh, you know, being agile and being able to flow and move and um, also feel what is the right communication method for the right circumstances. Yeah. And you have to have both. Um, right. I, I, I firmly believe that to broadcast your vision, you, you have to have these platforms face to face is your one on one impact or uh, and, uh, and uh, technology could broadcast your vision a little bit easier. Yeah, can you I think this is a really interesting uh, <laughs> point. Can you give some any like examples or anecdotes about how you've kind of, you know, flowed between these different mediums? Yeah, you know, uh, let's take the COVID, for example. Um, when everyone is decentralized and work from home or laid off or, or what have you, um, you need one platform for a group chat or one platform where people post pics and everything like that. That's how you kind of sustain this connectivity. So technology, obviously, the Zooms, the text messages, uh, even LinkedIn is 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 uh, adaptable. Now the pendulum swung, where now the debate is hybrid and and everything, which is efficient. But you can't again. I told you, mentor through like hybrid uh, spaces. So um, I, I think that's that's probably a good example where uh, we had no choice but to use tech and Zoom and FaceTime and text uh, during COVID, but. Oh, right now, I think it's just a tool of efficiency. And um, like I said, you have to be bilingual, trilingual. Um, but you can't be a leader through tech. You could be a manager through tech, but it's very hard to be a leader through tech. But tech could expedite your innermost thoughts and visions and graciousness and philosophies because you're broadcasting what's on the top of your mind. Um, um, but then it, it doesn't doesn't translate uh, like one of your first questions is, you know, w w what's your legacy, why you're here and stuff like that. So it's pretty counterintuitive, but it'll definitely um, su support it, though. Yeah. So what you're what you're saying is that to really be a leader, there's that human face to face contact that's really critical. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been inspired or mentored by a leader that um, I, I mean, I have watched YouTube and great speeches and everything like that, but uh, uh, but I've never really um, emulated anyone um, through video or through reading their book. I, I've emulated a leader through osmosis and it's like parenting, right? Like there's no rule in parenting, but you kind of grow up to be your parents. Kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, that progressive commercial, like don't be your parents, you know? Uh, <laughs> But yeah, you, you uh, so that that osmosis, that emulation uh, has to be human. I, I, I don't uh, I don't see any other way. Yeah. And it, is there so it's it's being in a person's presence and watching them. Are, are there other things that you think that like physical that, you know, physical proximity it, why it's so important for that leader and, or let's say follower, I don't, or colleague relationship, what makes that so important? Yeah, it makes it like, let's talk macro level. Like, I think there's a lost art of a town hall. I think that every department silos itself with its own lines ups or pre shifts or pre meals or whatever they call it. So I like the habitual town hall where everyone uh, maybe it's quarterly or in the room. Um, that's how the old villages and communities used to do it. We should start learning from that history. I think that also is a hard reset on memos and 
bulletin boards in the cafeteria and text messages and what have you. The town halls, just great. So I love town halls because it's a Q&A and I emulated that back in the 90s. I was nine years of Four Seasons and I remember Izzy Sharp, the founder, and at that time you had about 100 hotels. He visited every one and he put a bar stool uh, on the stage and we filled the ballroom and he did Q&A and I remember all the rooms division are detailing his room and blocking it three days before he comes and he gets the big presidential. And I remember he visited and the first place he went to was the employee locker room and the staff cafeteria. And he says, you have grout, uh, you have a little mold on the grout of the locker room as we spent two days detailing his, his suite. <laughs> so, uh, so that resonated with me and I was an hourly F and B person at the time. I probably was either a dishwasher or bus boy, but that really affected me. And, um, that, that was one of the seeds that I said, Hey, I could, I'm pretty interested in leadership, no matter what my position was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm digging, I'm really digging deep on this one because, um, you know, it reminds me also of what's coming with the whole AI discussion and, <laughs> you know, the idea that AI can replace humans. And this is exactly why there's, there are things that only happen because of human being in contact with humans. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's a really key point for the future of leadership that, you know, to be able to inspire, you know, we're, we're inspired by the physical presence. What you're saying is by the physical presence of another human being and the things that they teach us and their emotions and their unique experiences and things like that. And, and that's a real question if that will ever be emulated by a computer. Yeah, I'm just dabbling in it. So uh, it's really interested. Um, I asked ChatGPT stuff that I'm trying to programmatic out. Like we have a new, we're launching a new restaurant in Charleston. And I just said, what are the, you know, I, I just keep having this correspondence with this, <laughs> this chat uh, saying, what are the opportunities of a new restaurant concept in Charleston? And you, it's just crazy what they could pull from the, the ether out there. Uh, and then yeah. you just kind of hone down some of your questions. So I use it as a data point, just a, uh, you're, I'm just a natural curious person and it's fascinating, you know, that it really helps your R and D, you know, and, Absolutely. Uh, and it's like, Oh, like oyster po' boy, what's the best oyster po' boy recipe? Well, this restaurant does it well, blah, 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 blah. And, and it's just very interesting, uh, just tinkering with it. That it's like, Oh my gosh, Absolutely. I could see how scary this is going to be, you know, mm -hmm. so. it's a fantastic tool. Yeah. yeah I, I use sure. it as a curious data point only cause, uh, I can't avoid it. It's like, I'm reading about it all the time. It's like, let, let yeah. me try and dabble in it. You know? Yeah, well, and it's it's like a gold mine for curious people because it's all about asking questions yeah. and 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 then asking the next question, yeah. the next question, and, and adapting your wording just in a certain way so that you get a different response. Yeah, I. Uh, um, but then it makes you proud, like conversely from the imposter syndrome where we're launching anthology which is this event spaces uh with our company in detroit it's like what's the best way to market big event space in detroit for weddings and it listed everything that i already knew and i knew more than it so uh, that was a little human victory for me i'm like blah 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 yes i know put it on c event and the knot and everything like that but it was it's a good data point you know just to see what it answers me so yeah so at that point i was like hey you know uh we do all that and you, sh you could do more. So it's not totally perfected yet, but I could see yeah. if I was never in that space, how important that, that information was to me. Well, I think another thing that you point out with that example is that, um, you know, there's, you can find, you know, you could easily write a blog post from with a prompt into chat GPT about a particular uh, a, a topic. However, what it misses is the unique human experience that's related to that topic. 
So if you want to write like a compelling blog post that has human feeling, you may use that information and as a, as a data point, like you said, but it's really what you infuse from your own yeah. experiences, what, which, and the adaptation of that concept that makes it really something worth reading. Yeah. For sure. Um, so anyways, sorry, it's so going off on a major tangent there, but I think it's a really important topic, uh, on, uh, and especially with things that are emerging these days. Um, so what is your leadership edge? Uh, I think my edge is, uh, approachability. Um, even when I enter new spaces with new teams, I don't even announce who I am. Um, I like to list, I engaged, I was talking to the valet captain here in Wilmington for a couple of weeks now. And, and, uh, and uh, it took him three weeks to realize that I'm the CEO of the company and it was like an undercover boss. So uh, yeah. I, I think that it's the great. approachability uh, and I think it is uh, probably um, just get granular, uh, like put in your, your, your elbow grease, I think. Uh, obviously, you're paid to strategize and execute and implement, but also... Um, just getting down in the trenches, I think is probably my edge, but, um, but definitely, um, uh, just definitely getting to know all the staff. And I think my biggest, um, way I do things is, uh, it's very Simon Sinek, but, you know, once you explain why things are there and, you know, um, they're almost getting a little lesson in, in business and, uh, then they get it right. You don't, People are smarter than you really think. So, you know, uh, once you educate them how profit and loss work and, you know, and all that kind of stuff like that, just general business uh, talk, uh, there's a fascination there. You know, no one says, I just park cars. That's boring to me. They're like, oh, that's how it works. And usually it's like 99% of my uh, responses. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like that ability to, to relate and inspire, um, yeah. is what really, what really makes you successful. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think, yeah. Coming from humble beginnings, obviously I think is great. Like my parents immigrated here from the Philippines. So it wasn't, wasn't like, uh, I was, uh, I was bred to be, uh, a, a leader. I, I think, uh, the Filipino custom, uh, at least as a nation, is very subservient. That's why there's a lot of nurses and stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just kind of fell into it. Yeah, that's great. So my my final question today, what vision would you pursue if you had everything you needed right now? Um, you know, uh, uh I could ask the geeky thing, right? And then I could ask like, so the philosophical thing, my soul would love just an amazing eulogy, right? I don't care about my resume, I care about my eulogy. So if my eulogy just had a bunch of people saying from all walks of life, saying the same things about me, I think, uh, I think, that's, uh, I think that's kind of the epitome of the legacy I'd like to live, but from a profession standpoint, I just kind of believe there's a better way of this integration of all these business models of, like I said, uh, that community of co-working and whether it's private club, hotels, short-term rentals, um, multifamily, I think it's a convergence. I think yeah, hospitality always uh, wants to look residential and residential always needs hospitality. And I say, why don't, this merger, uh, there's got to be a better mousetrap. So I like to be known as the leader in that space. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think those are my two like technical and philosophical answers to that. Yeah. You, and you actually answered as well, a question I forgot to ask, which is how do you want to be remembered? 
Um, so I, I think that oh, yeah. relates it, that relates there. I skipped over, yeah. him, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it, on the one hand, one on part of it, it sounds like, you know, you really want to, it, when it's all is said and done, you'd like people to remember you the, the way that you wanted to live and the, and that it was authentic and that it, that it happened the way that you thought it did. And that that's the way that people remembered you. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in this, so on the, the technical side of things and what you're doing now today with these multi-use developments, um, you talked about this new concept. What's that, the dream? there from where you are now um yeah i think our opus project and test the fits a project called the overline that has uh, a lot of those components in there and that there is a gold rush of other companies trying to execute all this vertical but if it could be under one community under one management uh almost like disney like if you could affect how this whole community of different business models kind of like act like you go to Disney world and like every, whatever they call them, cast members act the same. And they have these rules of engagement and protocol. Um, not that I'm a rule giver. I'm more of a, more of a leader than a rule rule maker. I'm world breaker more. Um, but like, if you could feel that atmosphere, no matter what inch of the property, whether you're working out or you're renting by the month or renting by the day or you're a restaurant patron or a wedding guest. But if you could all feel that same culture, I think that's kind of the I think that's the the apex of the vision. Uh, and that culture is based on kindness and altruism as a spoiler alert. If you could feel that culture into one one campus. I was just going to yeah. ask, what is that? What is that culture? So you said it's kindness and altruism. Oh yeah. If all my leaders are humble and all my staff is kind, everything's easy. I mean, hospitality is so easy. So it's that easy and that hard. So you almost have to be like a preacher. You got to have a lot of emotional intelligence and a lot of wisdom of why that, why we act this way. Um, so yeah, it has to have that sort of philosophical component to it, but yeah, kindness is universal and, uh, and ego is the things that like tear down companies. So, so yeah, I think if, uh, if there's no ego and, uh, and kindness and treating each other is more important than treating the guests, I think, I think that's a great start for any culture. Uh, it's just, you have to break it down very simplistic. You can't. You can't have these, I can't hire a branding agency and have these 10 commandments and manifesto and company, uh, all that mission statement, which is great and it's needed and those are mechanics, but it's as simple as kind, kind staff and humble leaders, you know? Yeah. So that, that legacy, um, and being the, the leader of a, uh, of a concept like that, that achieves that when all is said and done, that will be a success. Yeah. 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 There's uh, yeah. a lot more to it than that, but that it, once you yeah. have a North star, then everything yeah. else is just uh, pointing towards that North star. So uh, especially hiring, right. If, you know, especially hiring, right? Coming from a line staff, what's the saying? Those who are not nice to the waiter are not nice people. So mm -hmm. I could have an unbelievable pedigree and a charming candidate, but if I could feel a bit of ego, I'll have some pause because it's not about them. It's about us. And, and so, uh, I think that's a, it's a good way to start. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for being here You're today. Welcome. Is there anything else you would like our listeners to know? No, um, uh, we're redeveloping the Method Co website and we're in nine cities and that's great. And if you want to, I haven't blogged in a while, but a lot of my philosophies are um, at jeffdavidhospitality.com. So you could check it out there. I still have to update awesome. it a bit. Make sure to put that. We'll put that in the show. Notes. Shameless plug, shameless plug, but that's it. But like I said, if you want to expand and please LinkedIn me. Uh, um, and uh, other than that, it's great. Great.
Well, thank you so much for being here, Jeff. Um, this is Rachel Vandenberg with the Travel Leader Podcast. Have a great day. All right. Take care.